Hey YouTube, that Brady Chick here. Long time no see. I'm here with another NCLEX tips video. And with this video, honestly, I realize I talk a lot, you know, especially about these topics. I know there's a lot to know, but there's also just like minuscule things you need to know. Just the main points, pretty much. So what I'm going to do for this video, my game plan is to pretty much introduce these topics to you in five minute intervals. So I'm going to do like five minute explanations for each topic. So let's get into it. Let's hurry up and do this. Okay. I'm timing myself too. All right, so starting with hypothyroidism. So the way that I remember hypothyroidism in terms of its signs and symptoms is that everything goes down with hypothyroidism, right? Because hypo means low. With hypothyroidism, everything's gonna go low. So you're gonna have low temperature, which means you're gonna have that cold intolerance. You'll have fatigue, AKA low energy. Low metabolism as well is a big one. So that's why when you see someone with hypothyroidism, typically they're gonna be a little bit on the bigger side because with a low metabolism, what do you get? Weight gain. So that's hypothyroidism. And by the way, the thyroid is located in the neck. It's right here. Before we go any further from there, to treat hypothyroidism, you're obviously gonna give them more thyroid hormone, right? So you're gonna give them, I believe they get actual synthetic thyroid called levothyroxine, which is meant to increase your thyroid hormone because they have a low thyroid, so you wanna give them more thyroid to normalize it out and then there's hyperthyroidism so hyper means high right so you have too much thyroid so now you're gonna have everything go up because the thyroid hormone is high in hyper thyroidism what you'll have is high temperature so now you're gonna have heat intolerance so you'll be too hot all the time you'll have high metabolism thus weight loss with hyperthyroidism because your metabolism is so high which means it's so fast that you're just burning off all these calories and you're gonna lose weight as a result so with hyperthyroidism because you're making too much thyroid we're trying to decrease the amount of thyroid that exists in your body so the way that we typically do that is through surgery aka the thyroidectomy they're actually gonna have to take out the thyroid gland itself so that is going to stop overproducing so much thyroid hormone that you don't necessarily need right but the thing is when you take out that thyroid gland you're not going to be producing thyroid period so because of that you're going to have to be on thyroid medication for the rest of your life after taking your thyroid gland out which makes sense because if the very source that makes it is no longer there then of course we have to ingest the hormones now because our body can't make it anymore because the thyroid gland is out. The things you want to worry about with that would be anything that involves airway complications. For example, airway swelling, swallowing too much, like frequent swallowing is what they call it, which is a major, major indication that the patient is bleeding, like bleeding out because of the surgery that they just had at their neck, which obviously is a major, major, major priority because it's an airway complication, but it's also like a circulation complication, right? Because they're losing all this blood and also it's impacting the way they breathe, right? If they keep swallowing, all this blood and they're not getting any air in but also with thyroidectomy you want to think about hypocalcemia because remember at the very back of the thyroid gland are the parathyroid glands and those little glands they release calcium right so if you're taking out the thyroid gland by default you're also taking out the parathyroid glands which means that you're going to have low calcium in the body so the patient will also present with those symptoms of the twerk of the wrist which is trousseau's and the chivostec sign which i mentioned in my last video check it out if you want. Yeah, we're going to look for hypocalcemia and we're going to look for those complications of the thyroidectomy being the bleeding and the airway complications. And that is four minutes and 45 seconds. Moving on to Addison's and Cushing's. So a lot of people get confused with this, but basically with Addison's, you want to pay attention to the D's in the word Addison's. Think of D as in down. And then for Cushing's, think of U in Cushing's as in up. So that's how you could think of it. So Addison's would be a very low steroid hormone. Cushing's would be very high steroid hormones like there's too many of them so that's something that my um pathophysiology teacher taught us and it just stuck with me ever since with addison's it is obviously treated with steroids because if you have low steroids we want to give them steroids to increase them since they're so low and in terms of signs and symptoms addison's has that really tanned appearance and the way you could remember that is because addison from tiktok i'm sure a lot of people know of her or whatever 
to be honest she doesn't really show up on my page but somehow she's very famous i don't know how but anyways so addison think of her as a very tanned woman right so when you think of addison's disease think of addison herself being tanned and then you'll remember that addison's disease presents with a very tanned appearance that's how i remember it i don't know okay and another thing you should know is that with both addison's and cushing's disease both of these diseases are acting on the adrenal glands right and the adrenal glands control the four s's which would be sugar which is glucose sex salt and obviously steroids so with addison's if your steroids are low down in addison's then you're also going to have low sex, low sugar, low salt, and low steroid, obviously. So with low sex, it just means that you're going to have some reproductive issues, which also happens in Cushing's disease as well. So for example, an irregular menstrual cycle or maybe ejaculation issues for men. So you don't really have to know that in detail, but just know that there's reproductive issues in general with both Addison's and Cushing's. And then there's low salt. So low salt means low sodium because salt is sodium. And if there's low sodium, then there's low aldosterone. And if there's low aldosterone, that means that there's high potassium because aldosterone and potassium have an inverse relationship. So if one is high, the other one is low. So if we have Addison's, which means we have low salt and low aldosterone as a result, then that means our potassium is high. So it's going to lead to some dysrhythmias, cardiac dysrhythmias. So now we're affecting the heart with something that's originally affecting just the adrenal glands, right? So that can cause some systemic issues right there. And then there's low sugar, right? So low sugar would be hypoglycemia. So that's going to lead to fatigue, hunger, and death because remember the saying that goes hypogly, the brain might die, right? So hypoglycemia is never a good thing. So we did low sex, low sugar, low salt, and of course low steroids. Just remember someone with Addison's has a very tanned appearance and they have a kind of a thin appearance as well along with lack of hair. They have alopecia too, right? So look for those key terms tanned thin alopecia and their steroid hormones are low so they have addison's okay so moving on to cushing so cushing's is when you have too much steroids now because remember cushing's has a u which means the steroids are up so with too much steroids that can actually affect the skin right i don't know what the correlation is there but high steroids can cause more pressure injuries right remember those the bruising on the skin that could actually go like very very deep and tunnel through depending on how bad the bruise is those are pressure injuries so you'll have more of a risk of pressure injuries because high steroids makes the skin a lot more fragile but it also makes the bones a lot more fragile too with high steroids also you'll have that characteristic moon face and the buffalo hump which is like that hump at the back of the neck also steroids themselves are immunosuppressants so if steroids are high then that means this person's going to be more immunosuppressed which means that it'll be harder for them to fight off infections because their immune system is suppressed right so that's obviously a very big issue too especially with their skin and their bones being so fragile too it's just going to invite even more infections they're also going to present with hirsutism which is actually kind of an overgrowth of hair like all over not just on the head but just all over the body um which is a direct opposite of what you would see with addison's because you would see more alopecia with that but with cushing's you see more of a big hairy sudism which is what simple nursing calls it her suit Suitism is just think of a big hairy suitism, like their whole body is just covered in hair. Not excessive, but it's like more hair than you would see with Addison's, for example. Uh, that fat pad at the back of their neck is actually called the dorso cervical fat pad. And then, of course, they have the moon face, the truncal obesity, the hirsutism. So it's very distinct characteristics uh, versus Addison's, you know. In terms of what happens internally, of course, with Cushing's, the steroids are high, which then means that there's high salt high sex, high sugar. So with high salts, that's high sodium. And remember, water follows sodium. So if, if the sodium is high, then we're going to have some fluid overload. But it also means that aldosterone will be high because sodium and aldosterone have that direct relationship where both of them will be high or both of them will be low. But in this case, both of them are high. So if aldosterone is high, that means potassium is low. Because remember, potassium and aldosterone have an inverse relationship. So they're very opposite. So now that aldosterone is high, potassium is low, can still lead to dysrhythmias. So it's like either way, whether you're in Addison's or Cushing's, you'll have cardiac dysrhythmias because potassium will either be low in this case or high 
in the Addison's case. So that's high salt and then high sugar obviously can lead to diabetes, uh, specifically type 2, because type 2 diabetes is the one that you're not born with. It's one that you actually can acquire later on. Type 2 diabetes can happen because of the high glucose, aka the high sugar. So then you'll have those symptoms of diabetes being the polyuria, which is too much peeing, polyepsia, which is being dehydrated, thirsty because you're peeing so much, and then polyphagia, which is hunger. And then you'll have high sex hormones pretty much, which will also lead to reproductive issues like Addison's, but specifically it'll lead to the hirsutism for Cushing's versus the alopecia for Addison's, where you have the low sex hormones because the steroids are low. So yeah, the high steroids themselves lead to immunosuppression. They can lead to fractures because remember, high steroids cause fragile skin and bones. So they lead to fractures, but they also lead to pressure injuries because of the fragile skin part right so you definitely don't want that so in terms of treatment for both for cushing's you definitely want to treat with surgery right here's another tip anytime a gland is overproducing hormones it's usually treated with surgery because you want to kind of take that gland out if it's overproducing hormones which it's not supposed to be doing like in this case so for cushing's where the steroids are up so too much it's treated with surgery to remove the adrenal glands or to remove the pituitary gland via the transphenoidal surgery. So that's going to be through the nose. Thus, after the surgery, you want to look for CSF drainage, which is called rhinorrhea, because rhino means nose. But yeah, you want to look for the CSF drainage. So if they start to have like a bit of a nosebleed or just drainage coming from the nose, you want to check for glucose, aka the halo ring around that drainage. Like just put a towel under them or put like a paper, whatever. Anything that can catch the drainage, put it under them and look to see if there's like a yellow ring around that drainage. If there is, then it means that that's literally CSF draining from their nose. And sometimes it could be draining from the ear too, which would be autorrhea. Auto means ear. But either way, you want to look at that drainage and see if there's a halo ring around it. And if there is, then we know it's CSF and it indicates that there's some brain injury, which is a priority. And then for Addison's, that's where we're giving them steroids as a treatment, right? So obviously because their steroids are down, we want to give them synthetic steroids. Also have to be careful because, because long-term steroid use can actually lead to Cushing's disease because obviously if you give someone steroids and they increase so much so where we have excess amount of steroids, then we're going to have the symptoms of Cushing disease, which would be the moon face, the buffalo hump back here, the fragile skin, fragile bones, the hirsutism called the big hairy suitism, right? Like you're going to have all those symptoms. So you have to be careful about how much you're taking, how much you're giving, make sure you're taking it as prescribed. Over time, excessive steroid use, whether you have Addison's or Cushing's or neither of the two, if you're taking steroids just by themselves for the long term, it could lead to osteoporosis later on, which makes sense because too much steroids do cause fragile skin and bones in this case. And that was definitely over five minutes. Sorry about that. This one isn't the biggest topic, but it's still something to know. So for ADHD, the drug of choice, especially for kids, would be methylphenidate. So methylphenidate is a stimulant, right? Um, so because it's a stimulant, it's supposed to make you kind of more like hyperactive, more alert. But for someone with ADHD, which is literally attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but mainly attention deficit, methylphenidate actually works the opposite in ADHD clients because it actually makes them pay more attention, right? To Like it actually helps them calm down and sit there and pay attention versus being hyperactive and like not being able to focus on one thing, which is odd because it's a stimulant, but it does the opposite for ADHD patients, but that's just how it works. Keeping in mind that it's a stimulant, you want to make sure to educate the parents and let them know to always take the methylphenidate in the morning before school, right? So that by the time the kid gets to school, they can actually sit there and focus. So never take it before bed, like never at bedtime, never in the evenings after dinner, never before bed because because why? Like methylphenidate is a stimulant. So if you're taking a stimulant before bed, you're not going to sleep through the night. It's going to cause insomnia, which means they're not going to sleep through the night because they're taking a stimulant right before bed. So you never want to do that, right? The only time you want to take a medication before bed is if it's a sedative, right? Because sedatives sedate you and calm you down and make you go to sleep. So it's perfect to take it before bed versus taking it before you have to do something that requires you to be alert, like driving a car or something. You never want to take a sedative before you drive a car obviously i hope that's obvious at least something like that you would want to take before bed but methylphenidate being a stimulant do not give it before bed because it will cause insomnia and also you never want to pair stimulants with stimulants such as um coffee 
yeah, right? You never want to pair methylphenidate with coffee. And they'll try to trick you and be like, oh, uh, recommend to the parent that they should give coffee with the methylphenidate so that it works better. Like, no, that you never want to pair two stimulants together because coffee also makes you kind of hyperactive and more alert. That's why people always say, I need my coffee so I can wake up. Wake up means that it's going to stimulate you, right? So don't pair the two. Obviously, you don't want to pair methylphenidate with any other stimulants like cocaine, right? Cocaine is a stimulant. And yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know. And also, it's good to take methylphenidate on an empty stomach before school. I'm not sure why. I think it was mainly because food actually decreases the absorption of methylphenidate or just decreases the effect of methylphenidate. So you want to take methylphenidate on an empty stomach before school never before bed and never with any other stimulants just remember that okay so in terms of some gi stuff so let's start with diverticulitis so with itis we know that that means inflammation so if a patient has diverticulitis we want to think they have inflammation of their bowel and if they have an inflamed bowel then that's going to lead to a lot of diarrhea so that's a very overactive bowel it's always working it's always it's always shooting poo out i guess you could say so in that case you want to give the bowel a break because it's so overactive so in this case we would actually avoid high fiber foods which is odd because usually you want to recommend those but because the bowel is so overactive it's like the high fiber food will make it even more overactive so in this case we're trying to avoid the high fiber food we want to give them pretty much give them junk food so that the bowel can be more like more constipated for lack of a better term because it's so overactive so we want to kind of slow down the bowel movements by avoiding the high fiber food and actually recommend junk food in this case because we want to slow down the diarrhea at the end of the day or we can also just make them NPO right nothing by mouth just so that we're not feeding them anything that's going to go down to the bowel and have the bowel work right so that would be NPO which gives them their bowel a break just all together we also want to think of antibiotics right because with itis, it means inflammation. Inflammation can sometimes mean infection. We also want to think of pain, right? Because obviously an overactive bowel that's inflamed could cause some pain for the patient. So they might need some analgesics. They might even need antiemetics if they if they start vomiting because their bowel is so overactive and manipulated. Um, the total opposite of all this would be diverticulosis. So this is constipation. And the way that I differentiate the two is that there's an O in diverticulosis and there's also an O in constipation. So that's how I see the two. So with diverticulosis, you want to do the complete opposite of what you would do with diverticulitis. So with diverticulosis in that case, you want to encourage high fiber food because the patient is constipated, right? So there's no poo coming out and now we actually want it to come out because there's none coming out. So now we're giving them the high fiber food. We're encouraging movement and exercise. Exercise can literally just be telling the patient to ambulate, just to walk down the hall. Like that could be seen as exercise, right? And then we're also encouraging enough fluid for the day, right? Like 1500 to 2000 mils per day of fluid, aka 1.5 to 2 liters of fluid per day. That's something that you want to encourage for someone who's constipated, aka someone who has diverticulosis. Let's move on to PPIs and H2 receptor blockers. So the PPIs usually have the suffix prazole, like pantoprazole. They're actually very common in hospital because just the very stress of being bedridden, of being in the hospital, can cause stomach ulcers. So that's why a lot of patients are put on prazoles, antoprazole, for example, just to prevent those stomach ulcers. In terms of H2 receptor blockers, they usually end with tadine, like renatidine, for example. Both H2 receptor blockers, if prescribed, and PPIs are given 30 minutes before a meal in order to kind of tame the stomach acid prior to a meal entering the stomach, just in order to prevent the ulcers from forming right these are both kind of preventative medications that's why they're given 30 minutes before a meal versus after you know it's better to give before a meal in terms of ppis though specifically the prazoles um you definitely want to supplement prazoles with vitamin d as well as calcium because um, prazoles can actually lead to fractures as well like depending on how much you take them like they kind of decrease the bone density in a way i just forget the pathology behind it but yeah that's why you want to supplement with calcium and vitamin d if you're taking a prazole also, keep in mind the potential risk of prazoles causing C. difficile. C. difficile is that contact precaution type of infection, super infection actually, that causes that watery diarrhea and it's like really hard to get rid of. 
and you have to use like pretty much really strong antibiotics to try to get rid of it. Yeah, prazoles could actually lead to C. difficile, right? So just be wary of that as well. And with chidines, the way I remember it is it's given 30 minutes before you go to dine. To dine sounds like to dean, so that's kind of how I remember that. Prazoles, I only remember that because as a nursing student, I would always like give prazoles 30 minutes before each meal and it would literally say that in the chart. So that's, that's the only reason I remember that part, but yeah. Oh, then there's also sucrophate. The sucrophate protects the stomach lining by coating it with a protective layer before food is actually put into the body. So sucrophate is given one to two hours before or after you ate and taken late, right? To help you remember. I don't think sucrophate will be tested, but just keep in mind that it's one of those stomach ulcer preventers. This one specifically will coat your stomach with a protective layer before food gets into your stomach. Okay, now moving on to diabetes insipidus. I know this is one that confuses a lot of people and trust me, I was one of those people at, at a point, but I'm gonna try to simplify it for you guys. So diabetes insipidus is very different from the traditional diabetes. And that traditional diabetes is actually called diabetes mellitus, DM. That's why you have DM1, DM2, which is diabetes type one, diabetes type two. But the difference between diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus is that diabetes insipidus has actually nothing to do with high glucose. Diabetes mellitus has everything to do with high glucose. Now, you might be asking, okay, so why is the word diabetes in the phrase diabetes insipidus? I think the only reason they put it there is because diabetes insipidus involves polyuria as like the main symptom or the main sign rather, because it's something you can observe as well. So with diabetes insipidus, of course, this person is going to pee out a lot and that's where the diabetes part comes in uh, because diabetes traditionally causes polyuria, right? So diabetes insipidus causes polyuria as well, but just has nothing to do with high glucose. So with diabetes insipidus, yes, they're peeing out a lot, which then leads to weight loss because you're peeing out water weight mostly, which can then lead to fatigue and dehydration because you're losing all that water. And in terms of urine specific gravity, think about urine specific gravity, by the way, as being inverse to urinary output. So with diabetes insipidus, yes, there's polyuria. Polyuria means that there's high urine output because there's a lot of pee coming out, which means that there's low urine specific gravity, which means that the pee is very dilute. But if you wanna remember whether the urine specific gravity is high or low, just remember that it's always opposite to the urinary output. So in diabetes insipidus, urinary output is high, which means urine specific gravity is low, which literally just means that the pee is very dilute. Also, if they're peeing out a lot, it kind of allows the solutes as well as the medications within the patient's body in case they're ingesting any to be very high in concentration, right? Because all this water is escaping the body. So now the body's getting very dehydrated and dry inside. So it allows anything that's not water, so anything that's like drugs or um, solutes like sodium to accumulate or increase in the body because all the water is coming out. Right, so in this case, water is not following sodium in uh, diabetes insipidus, right? And that's why I mentioned in the previous video that it's kind of the exception to the rule when it comes to diabetes insipidus because water doesn't follow sodium with diabetes insipidus because the water is actually escaping the body at high rates and the sodium is allowed to increase in the body for that reason because the body's getting so dry right? It's getting dry of the water and allowing the solute to stay within the body and increase. And another way you can remember diabetes insipidus versus diabetes mellitus is that with diabetes insipidus, kind of put an emphasis on the sip part of insipidus, right? Because it kind of means that this patient is so dehydrated that they need a sip of water with diabetes insipidus. And it's true because the patient does become very dehydrated with diabetes insipidus since they're peeing out all their water. They'll also have low blood pressure too because they're peeing out all their water. So they'll have weight loss, low blood pressure, uh, fatigue, and a low specific gravity because the urinary output is so high and solutes will accumulate because their body is lacking water. If water is low in the body, usually the solutes get to increase. So th the main reason for it is because the ADH that we produce, which is that antidiuretic hormone, is low, right? So if you have a low antidiuretic hormone, it means you have a low hold of urine, which means that we're releasing high amounts of urine, right? Because if we have a low hold of urine, it means that we can't hold in the urine into our body, so it just keeps getting released like it does with diabetes insipidus. So if our ADH is 
is low, obviously we treat that patient with ADH, aka desmopressin with diabetes insipidus because we're low in ADH if we have diabetes insipidus. So again, ADH, think of it as hold of urine. Just look at the H in ADH and think of it as the hold of urine. So if someone has a low ADH, they have a low hold of urine. If you have a low hold of something, what happens? You release it, right? So if we have a low hold of P, then we're releasing pretty much all of our P because we have a low ADH. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's try to do this one in five minutes. So with SIADH, it's obviously the opposite of DI. So with SIADH, that means that you're soaked inside, right? So soaked inside means that you're holding in a lot of urine, a lot of water. Like there's pretty much fluid overload happening. That's why with um, SIADH, the patient might appear a little bit on the bigger side because they're holding in all this water weight. And if they're holding in all this fluid, that means that they're not peeing out a lot, right? So instead of polyurea, they're now going to have oligurea or sometimes anurea, which means very, very little pee, like literally just drops of pee for the whole day. So very little pee, they'll have fluid overload, which then leads to high blood pressure because you're retaining all that fluid inside. So the blood pressure is going to increase. And then because they have low urinary output, because remember they have oligorrhea if they're soaked inside, since they're not letting out barely any pee, and that means with a low urine output, they're gonna have a high specific gravity, right? Because remember, the amount that you're peeing out or the urinary output will be opposite to the specific gravity. So if you have a low urinary output, you have a high specific gravity, which pretty much means you'll have sticky, thicky urine with SIADH, which you can remember because SIADH starts with an S and so does sticky, thicky urine. And another way you can remember it too is that um, SIADH involves too much ADH, too much of a hold of urine because you're holding everything in side, right? The actual phrase ADH is involved in SIADH. So that's that's how you can remember that there's too much ADH. Weight gain instead of weight loss like you would get with diabetes insipidus since you're peeing everything out. Um, SIADH leads to sticky thicky urine because of the high urine specific gravity due to the low urinary output. And of course, because everything is being held in, like all the water is being held in, that's going to actually cause hemodilution of the solutes that are inside. So you're gonna have dilutional hyponatremia. So that pretty much means that your sodium is going to appear low with SIADH because there's just so much water being held inside that it just drowns out all the sodium that's in your body, right? Because there's more water than there is sodium in your body at that point if you're soaked inside with all this water, right? So um, instead of sodium accumulating or increasing like it would with diabetes insipidus, because you're releasing all that water uh, with soaked inside or with SIADH, you're soaked inside with all this water. So now that's draining out all the sodium and sodium is going to appear low while water is remaining high inside your body because of the increased ADH, the increased hold of urine. So because with SIADH, you have all this water held inside, you're obviously going to be on fluid restriction because you have so much fluid being held inside, right? You don't want to increase that fluid even more by drinking more. You most likely will have to be supplied with sodium, right? They might put you on some IV sodium because with low sodium, which happens with SIADH, because again, the water is drowning out all the sodium, making it appear low, that can actually lead to, lead to seizures, which could lead to other complications later on. So that's why they want to increase your sodium as well if you have SIADH. And on top of that, of course, because there's lots of fluid being held within the body, we want to release that fluid out at some point. So we would actually give them furosemide, right, to kind of drain the fluid out. And for both diabetes insipidus and SIADH, which are both obviously fluid balance issues and not sugar issues, like with diabetes mellitus, they're both fluid balance issues. So with any fluid balance issue, you want to look at intake and output. You want to monitor intake and output for both DI and SIADH because you want to see if that fluid is going down or going up. So this Period. is the third last topic. So there's chest tubes. So if the chest tube detaches from the machine, the actual chest tube machine, which I'll insert right here, if the chest tube detaches from that machine, then you want to put the other end of that chest tube into a jar of sterile water. The only reason we're doing this is because we're trying to mimic the actual machine, right? Because chest tube would have been attached to a machine that involves water as well, right? But if it detaches from the actual machine, 
we want to put it into a, a cup or container of sterile water to kind of mimic the effects of that machine because at the end of the day we don't want any air going into the patient's lung and causing their lung to pop right giving them atelectasis a collapsed lung so because we don't want to make that worse we have to quickly mimic that chest tube machine if the tube detaches from the machine itself now if the tube detaches from the patient that's different because the patient, the tube detaching from the patient will allow air to get in, right? Into the chest where that open wound is. So in that case, you want to cover the site with occlusive dressing tapes on three, not four, sides, right? The reason you want to cover it with three sides or, well, with three pieces of tape instead of four is because if you covered it with four, then you're literally not allowing for any like chest expand. You kind of need space for like some air to escape the chest as well while avoiding air from getting into the chest at the same time. But it's like if you cover it with four, it's going to be too occluded and then the lung might actually pop because of all the pressure, right? Covering all four sides, then you're kind of allowing the pressure to build up within the chest and it can cause a collapsed lung that way. But with three sides, you're kind of allowing the patient to breathe and release air as they do. So these are just things that you want to see with the chest tube machine. So in terms of the water seal chamber, uh, you should see titling. So going up and down with the water in that seal chamber as the patient breathes in and out, right? So as they breathe in and out, you should see it tidal along with their the motions of their breath. Um, with the suction chamber, you should see continuous suctioning, right? Obviously, because it's a suction chamber, so you wanna see suctioning, but specifically continuous suctioning. With the collection chamber, you should monitor for blood drainage, right? Because the collection chamber is collecting blood. And the only time you wanna call the doctor is if you see 100 mils per hour or more of bright red blood in the collection chamber. That's when you wanna call the doctor. Now that might be a bit tricky because sometimes it'll say that the blood is um, dark red versus bright red. So if it's dark red in the collection chamber, you kinda of wanna look at how long the patient has been on the chest tube. Like if they've been on it for maybe eight hours and the blood is dark red at 100 mils, it's actually not concerning. First of all, because it's only at 100 mils over eight hours, not over one hour. But over eight hours and on top of that it's pretty much old blood because it's dark red versus bright red but if it was bright red at 100 mils and it's only been one hour that passed then of course you want to call the doctor because bright red blood is usually new blood which means they're actively bleeding like right now just be careful with that like pay attention to the details that they give you in the question because they will definitely give you a timeline um, especially if they want you to pay attention to the quantity that's being drained out of their chest so sedatives would be like benzos, right? Benzodiazepine, and they usually end with lamb and pam. So they are typically given for active seizures, not to prevent seizures, but for active seizures, right? Um, so things that would prevent seizures, for example, would be like phenytoin, which prevent future seizures. But benzos are usually for active seizures, and they're usually given for alcohol withdrawal, which can lead to seizures, or just any regular seizure, benzo is usually given. And it's because they work so quickly, right? But because they work so quickly, they're also given short term because they can be high highly, highly addictive. Yeah, benzos are sedatives, hence why they're given for hyperactive events like a seizure, right? Because with seizures, your muscles are twitching literally all over your body, so that's a very hyperactive event. So you're gonna need something that's going to slow that activity, right? Like a benzo. And it's also given for anxiety as well, because with anxiety, you're kind of having like these hyperactive thoughts and you can't really calm down, so benzos will help you calm down. And then there's Benadryl slash diphenhydramine. So obviously this is usually for allergies, but it also is a sedative. It also puts you to sleep. So remember, with sedatives, you want to make sure that you're not giving it to these patients before they have to do something that requires them to be alert. Like, for example, driving a car, operating heavy machinery. You don't want to give them a benzo for something like that or Benadryl, but you can give it before bedtime for sure because it's going to put them to sleep anyway. TCAs, for example, which are a type of antidepressant, amitriptyline, 
which Simple Nursing calls it Amy trips on things because it's a sedative because usually sedatives make you dizzy, have low blood pressure, very fatigued. So all of this can actually cause you to become a little bit unstable, right? Which is why Amy trips on things with amitriptyline because it's a sedative, but it's also an antidepressant. It's an antidepressant first before it is a sedative, but it does have those sedative side effects. So just remember Amy trips on things for amitriptyline. Also, imipramine is also a TCA, which is an antidepressant. Inhibits my peeing is what simple nursing calls it. Um, so it also has dry side effects like the dry mouth, the urinary retention, which is the inhibits my peeing part, um, the constipation, and even some dry eye side effects. So you have to worry about patients with glaucoma. You know, you never want to give a patient with glaucoma something that's going to cause dry side effects like amipramine. Although amipramine is not really highly tested, so you don't have to worry too much about it. But just remember, if it does come up, think about it as causing the dry side effects of can't see, which means dry eyes, glaucoma, can't spit. So so dry mouth, can't sh so constipation, can't see, can't pee, urinary retention, can't spit, can't sh yeah, so you get the point. And then lastly, we have anesthesia. If someone is going into surgery that requires them to be under anesthesia, one of the first things they should ask about is allergies, right? Because if, if they have allergies to anesthesia, it can actually lead to malignant hyperthermia, which is a very deadly condition. It is just like how it sounds. It's going to cause some very dangerous increases in their body temperature, which are going to lead to just other terrible side effects. Um, so for example, succinylcholine is a type of anesthesia. It might not be tested, but just know that like if they are going in for surgery, one of the first things you want to ask is, do you have any allergies to anesthesia or do you have any family members with any allergies to anesthesia, right? That could be asked for the past history or family history portion of the assessment. So just remember that. All right, guys, that completes the video. Honestly, I think those are all the quick tips that I had for you guys, like this video plus other videos that I've released in the past. Hopefully they help. And if you guys want a copy of the quick tips that I literally just read off on my notes here, then let me know. Ooh, I don't know if you could see that. But yeah, you might have to reach out to me still on Instagram. My Instagram is at jadeb. I'll be happy to help. Yeah, if you want these quick tips emailed to you, just reach out to me there on Instagram. Send me your email so that it's more private versus my comments, for example. Let me know, reach out to me. I'm only like a button away or an app away. Like, I'm here for you, I really am. Like, I understand how hard it is to study for the NCLEX. I've been there twice, twice. So let me know, cause yeah, all my quick tips are done. Did it in about three, four videos, but they're done. Thank you again for watching, guys. Um, good luck on your NCLEX. Hopefully you guys are doing that next generation NCLEX. I don't know for sure if they're gonna change it or not. Maybe it was just a rumor about the whole July thing. Hopefully it was a rumor for everybody's sake, but regardless, get it done as soon as possible. Get it done and get a job, girl or guy, okay? We've been in nursing school for long enough. It's time to get paid. It's time to start working in the industry. It's time to venture out and put our knowledge to the test. Like, come on, let, let's do this. Come on, we got this. So yeah, get your NCLEX, get your license, and get out there in the field, okay? Because it's time to start living our best nursing lives. All right? Okay. Thank you again for watching, guys. And always remember, natural hair grows, but I'm protecting mine right now. Don't you forget it. Bye.